Hello. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Whoa, everybody wait. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for attending. Um, we are here with our, what is this, seventh? Seventh Visiting Chef series here at Keystone College. This has been a great uh, opportunity for our students to get to work with a new chef from out of the area. We've done this for, you know, well, seven years, obviously. Um, and it's, it gives the students an opportunity to have hands-on experience outside of the chefs that we work with here at Keystone. And as many of you know, in the restaurant industry, as many chefs as you can work with is what we, is how we build our craft and how we build our trade because we've learned from so many other different people. We have brought in, this is the, the person that is the furthest that we've ever brought in um, to be our visiting chef. And this gentleman flew in all the way from Seattle, Washington. And we are very thrilled that he did that. The reason we were able to get him because He's my college roommate, so I'm thrilled to have him here. So we're having a great time just, just getting reacquainted. He's going to get up here and do his demonstration right now. Um, so welcome, Chef Christopher Schwartz. said that we went to school together a long time ago, seems like ages ago, but uh, and uh, so I do have uh, some fond memories of this area, coming here, you know, visiting Mark's family when we were in school, um, and uh, I'm just glad to be here. Uh, I'm originally from you know, New Jersey, from right outside New York City, and like Mark said, I, uh, I live in Seattle, Washington now, I've been out there for about 18 years. Um, made my way across the country, lived in Colorado for a while, uh, Massachusetts, um, and eventually ended up in the uh, Great Northwest. So it's a you know, fabulous place, great food city, it's uh, got a lot of great ingredients, uh, a lot of great, great scene going on food-wise, so it's a wonderful place to be. But again, I'm happy to be here this evening with all of you. And you know, I'd like to thank some of the folks that we work with today, some of the students, they did, did a great job. Do you have any questions to start before we dive in? Anything? Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk about a few of the, the uh, things that, three things that uh, we're going to talk about tonight. Sorry. Uh, one of the things is uh, salmon. So we tried to, when I, Mark asked me to come and we were talking about the menu and what we were going to do, we were going to try to focus on some of the things that uh, uh, I use uh, out in the Seattle area every day or almost every day or try to tailor the menu uh, along those lines. So one of the things that we were talking about was salmon, where we were thinking about uh, a different, different way to present it. Um, everyone's had, or most everyone's had, uh, you know, cured salmon, like gravlocks. Does everyone like salmon? Yeah. Too much about it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, salmon's a really, uh, you know, salmon's a really important part of the uh, culture and uh, the, the diet of uh, uh, people out in the, in the Northwest, starting from, you know, the Indian population, the Native American population. Uh, there's lots of controversy over uh, fishing and wild and farmed and all that so it's a you know it's a big it's a big uh, uh, big topic that's really uh, you know, everyone's talking about so I thought it would be interesting to, to talk about um, so what we have here is again I was thinking of some different ways to, to, to do the salmon and one of the ways that it seems like you see salmon a lot is is uh, gravlocks or a cured type salmon so I was thinking of a, um, a different way to present it. So one of the things that I like to do is uh, a quick cure, a quick cure on the, on the salmon or a quick cure on fish. You can do this with tuna or uh, black cod, which is one of the items that we're going to be utilizing tomorrow for the dinner. But um, this is a great way to just really quickly, where you don't have to do like a traditional side of salmon, where you know it takes upwards of two to three days to cure, uh, packing it, Pressing it, turning it, depending on your method or whatever. This is a really quick way to do it, where you can have a, uh, a a cured piece of tuna or salmon or whatever you're going to do in two to three hours. 
So we're going to take our salmon. We have a you know a nice six ounce piece here, cut down, nice fillet piece, and we make the quick cure for you here. It's really simple. I'm going to take some equal parts salt. Can everyone see? I'm not going to use it all. And equal parts sugar. that up. And then we're going to add some non-traditional, well, lemon's usually traditional in grab box, we're going to add some non-traditional orange and lime to it. So we're just going to take that and we're going to grate, grate that in there. That's going to give it some nice, you know, the, the fish some nice flavor. You have the, uh, the, the nice oil from the citrus. You can add, uh, you can add other flavorings to this, uh, fennel seed, coriander seed. Uh, this is just a nice quick, uh, quick cure to it. So just mix that up. And that the oil from the citrus is going to break down, and it's going to cause the sugar and the salt to have the like consistency of like wet sand, which is what you're looking for. And then all you're going to do is you're going to take your fish, you're going to you know liberally sprinkle it on. Not too much, you don't really have to pack it on because it is, it, you know, it's not a huge piece of fish. Okay. And then you go back and you just wrap it right back up. And you put that in the refrigerator, two, three hours, depending on the size of the, the fish that you have, it'll be done. And you take it out. Done. I have a finished piece right here. Voila. You take it out of that cure, you scrape away the cure. Uh, you, you know, just wash it with a little bit of cool water. You don't really want to wash it too much. Just uh, you know, sprinkle some water on to kind of wash any residual of the cure off, pat it dry, and then slice it nice and thin. So it has that has that Gravlox consistency. As you can you guys see that? Okay. And then if you were serving this, like if I was serving this maybe at the restaurant or one of our restaurants. Um, oh, I forgot to mention I'm the uh, corporate chef for a restaurant group in Seattle. We have. Uh, 10 restaurants, so I work at a lot of different restaurants. So, I need plates. Let me grab some plates. Sorry. Plates. Um, so, one of the uh, one of our restaurants is a, uh, a seafood heavy restaurant. So, this is a dish that maybe we would do there. So, taking the um, the salmon. This is a. Uh, Edamame puree. Does anyone know what edamame is? Soybeans, basically. So this is an edamame horseradish puree. So it's just ed uh, the soybeans, uh, horseradish, um, soy sauce, a little salt and pepper, and just pureed next to blanch the soybeans. Really tasty. Thank you.
So if I was doing this, I might just put that on the plate like that. Does anyone know what um, like crudo crudo is? Real popular, uh, like in Italy, um, you know, crudo is uh, any sort of raw fish, you know, sliced thin, tuna, salmon, um, scallop. We do a lot of that. Uh, this would be almost similar to that. I mean, it is cured, but it is we'll present it sort of like crudo. So we'll just have the salmon, you know, garnish it with a little bit of the edamame puree. These are beautiful microgreens that Mark wanted me to use. Just lovely, simple fish. Any questions? Questions? How much of your menus in the Tom Douglas restaurants are provided local and regional? A lot. Yeah, we, um, it's funny because I think the, I've worked for Tom Douglas for, that's the restaurant group I work for, I'm sorry to mention that, Tom Douglas restaurant, he's a James Beard, James Beard Award winner, he just won this past year the uh, Outstanding Restaurant Tour of the Year Award from James Beard, um, so he's a great, you know, great guy, his wife, him and his wife own the company, um, you know, great couple to work for, uh, and I've been fortunate fortunate to work for him for since 1995, except for two years when I was stupid enough to leave and try to open my own restaurant. Um, and uh, we've always kind of utilized local ingredients. Uh, we've always, um, uh, you know, used local farmers and sort of, you know, practice sustainable practices and, and uh, you know, really focused on that. I, I kind of find it uh, amusing how much in the limelight it is now, where you know now we have restaurants that are, we have a restaurant in Seattle called uh, Local 360, where they you know they do the whole local local boar cuisine, which is they're trying to you know utilize only ingredients from a certain uh, uh, radius from the city, and uh, you know it's just like we've been doing that for years. <laughs> You know, we have a we own our own farm out in South Central Washington, a little town called Prosser, which from about May until it's just winding up now, that uh, you know we get probably 75 percent of our produce from during that time of the year. So it's great. You know, we we definitely focus on that. Any questions? I think they're about to pass out some of the salmon, so hopefully you enjoy it. You can use yeah. You can use any. You could use a small paring knife, much like that, or even like a French type knife, like this glow. Uh, it really, you know, obviously having you know being sharp helps, and just your skill level. <laughs> Another item that we were going to talk about tonight was uh, one of the items that we're going to do uh, on our menu tomorrow, which is a spicy tuna tartare with a wild rice blink. So it's, uh, it's a take on, it's a take on a traditional blini, which is made with buckwheat flour. Uh, Best flea recipe I've ever worked with is from the Russian Tea Room in New York City. So if you're ever looking for a great flea recipe. But this one has doesn't have buffy flour in it. It is made with uh, wild rice and uh, has baking powder and uh, all that other good stuff in it. So I'm going to make some blinis here for you. Taste those. And we mix the tuna as well. Grab a bowl. Okay. 
So this is uh, this is the tuna that we're going to start with. This is a. Uh, uh, I believe we Mark got some yellowfin tuna or ahi. But really, ahi is the Hawaiian word for tuna. So ahi can uh, either mean uh, yellowfin or bluefin tuna. I think a lot of people think that ahi is its own variety of tuna. So the tuna, you know, sashimi grade tuna, just diced up really small. How's the salmon? Mixed results? So we take our salmon, um, I'm sorry, tuna. And we're going to add just a little bit of minced chives. Uh, a tablespoon of sake. We can use uh, the rice wine, a little sesame oil. I'm not going to add all the sesame oil just yet so that comes out. And a little bit of Chinese chili paste. Give it a little bit of spice to it. Mix that up. Add a little bit of kosher salt and white pepper. Butter in the pan.
Sure, in the tuna, the blini has the, uh, it's just cooked wild rice, and then it has uh, um, uh, baking soda, baking powder, all-purpose flour, salt, pepper, egg. Who made it today? Anthony, blini have egg in it? What? Is it blini batter have egg in it? Yeah, I put egg in it. There you go. <laughs> <coughs> These guys did a great job helping out today. And then the tuna has the uh, Chinese chili sauce, the chai, the sesame oil. You just want to flip them, get them a little brown, and cook on the other side. So they're nice and golden. Top the blini with a little bit of the tuna. Can I serve the vanilla here? Like I said, the tuna has a little bit of a kick to it, a little bit of heat from the, the Chinese chili sauce, but we have this nice cucumber yogurt that's going to go with it. This is simply um, Greek yogurt, a little bit of sour cream, uh, pureed cucumber, lemon juice, a little red chili flake, salt and pepper. This, this acts as the uh, balance for the tuna. Dollop that on top of the tuna. <laughs> and I found these. I've never seen these before, actually. They're yellow chives. Oh, I've never actually seen these before. I've seen like different forms of you know Chinese chives. We used to have this. Uh, uh, Great Chinese woman they used to drive down from Vancouver, Canada, bringing all sorts of uh, uh, produce to us in Seattle. But I never saw a, ch a yellow chive, so I saw these at the store the other day. So I just grabbed them, mixed these up. So I thought they'd look nice on top of here, too. Put those right on top of the cucumber yogurt. And then I have to sew the black sesame seed. One thing I really like to, like to use um, very similar, well not similar, but they look just like the black sesame seed. Is a nigella seed, is a black onion seed. So when you get like a, at the bakery, like a like an onion bagel or something like that, those are called nigella seeds. They're really nice. They have like a different texture to it as well. So there you go. That's the tuna. Just pick it up, chop it down. Questions? Comments? Yes. Uh, sure. Sure. Does the uh, Seattle area have a lot, it seems like a lot of influence on the Asian area? Kind of, mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking at because I'm seeing like your tuna and what you uh, the tuna and the yeah. tamarind. It seems like a lot of Asian. There is. There's, uh, it's, it's really started, it's changed a little bit, but especially like when I first moved there in 94, it, uh, you know, it was really in the forefront of like the pan. Asian cuisine, Japan Pacific cuisine, a lot of Asian influence. There's uh, Chinese, Japanese, they have in um, Seattle, it's called the International District, but uh, you know, great Chinese restaurants, great sushi, uh, Thai, Vietnamese, Cambodian, uh, Lo Loatian, lots of, lots of great influence. So lots of great, you know, lots of great ingredients. Uh, there's a store, um, called Wajamaya, which is in downtown, uh, down in Pioneer Square in Seattle, that is just like a, it's like a Costco of uh, Asian ingredients, like fish tanks, pretty cool, pretty cool. So, so that fish should, should be coming out for you as well, so we'll move on to the next one, unless you guys have any other questions. Smoked 
That this salmon? Yeah, the first one. That wasn't smoked. Oh, wasn't no, it was not smoked at all. Well, if you buy frozen salmon, it's raw. Sure. Can you quick cure that and then grill it somehow? Yeah, absolutely. Like you could take the piece that I have here. Um, this was the piece that I cut off of for this dish. You could certainly grill that and you know cut like yourself like a big medallion out of that and grill that. Yep, absolutely. Or you could smoke it as well too. Is that, what, is that your? Well, I'm just trying to think of how I could prepare it. My family would like the, the citrus taste, oh. but I just don't want to burn it. <laughs> okay. But do you like the smoke or you don't like the smoke? Yeah, I guess that's where it's. Well, I, I just it's hard to get really good smoked salmon like what you serve. Uh huh. Around here, it's not a. Yeah. So I mean, frozen salmon is readily available in the supermarket. Right. Okay, I got you now. Yeah, you could you could easily take this and cut it and grill this and serve it with you know like a warm potato salad or something like that. Okay, Absolutely. Angela, you had a question. I was just going to ask you, so what do you have to have to eat with a home visit? Oh, that's a great question. Everything. Did you come back to New York? Everything. Pizza, hot dogs. <laughs> Just about everything. Like I was saying, we, I was fortunate. I had to go to, to New York City on business um, just about a week and a half ago. So we flew in for three days. And um, the car picked us up at uh, JFK in New York. And, and we were going in, in Manhattan. And I was with two guys that, um, that worked for our company that had never been in New York before. So they were all like chomping at the bit, you know, talking about it. So I purposely made the driver stop at a pizza place down in Ranch Village that I used to go to all the time when I was a kid. And he's like, gotta go. And he didn't understand what the hell I was talking about at first. <laughs> I didn't think he was gonna take us. He's like, you gotta go, you gotta go take us. And I was like, do you want a piece of pizza? And he, again, he didn't understand, like, buy you a piece of pizza. He's like, no, yes, no, yes. So he's like saying yes. He's going to stop and know he didn't want pizza. It was really funny. They're like, do you want a piece or you don't want a piece? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, everything. My, my mother's cooking, uh, just cheese steaks. Just doesn't, it's, just, it's hard. It's hard not to eat a lot. Like you, know, you, know, you don't have, like, that's the one thing Seattle doesn't have. It doesn't have the, 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 the I don't want to, I don't want to say the culture, but just that. It has a great food scene, unbelievable restaurants, but you know you can't get a slice of pizza at twelve o'clock at you know at midnight right. or you know just that sort of style, or, you know, no diner or something like that. Right. Hey Jeff, yeah. are you able to kind of have some of your East Coast influences on some of the stuff that you do out west? Uh, yeah, a little bit. You know, I was fortunate. I worked in Italy at one point, so I definitely have a. Uh, you know, favoritism for that sort of food, and you know, I lived in, you know, went to school in Rhode Island, and lived in Massachusetts. I worked a couple of years in, you know, Nantucket, Massachusetts. So I have a, a, a really strong uh, affection for like East Coast fish, you know, because it's funny how um, being out in Seattle on the West Coast, and you, you think that it's such a uh, a, a, a seafood area. Which it is to a certain extent. I mean, obviously you can't beat, you know, the salmon and things like that, halibut. But they're very, very uh, focused on just those main items. Like, you know, salmon's crazy, halibut's crazy, crab. Uh, obviously, we have the best oyster area in the whole world. Um, but to sort of branch out from there, if you want to do something different, there's not a whole lot of options. There's more options definitely on the East Coast. That way. So that part of it I do miss. I used to deal with this. I still do a little bit. Um, this gentleman who flies stuff in from uh, from the East Coast from like Rhode Island and Massachusetts at a new live block. How's it tuna?
I did. <coughs> yeah, help yourself. Hey, you Take the apples and we're going to line our terrine mold. So you just kind of want to lay them in there. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just cover the bottom, overlap them, push them down. We're going to make like two layers of the apple. Okay, uh, cover, you know, covering all sides. You can take like the, you know, the part of the apple that has a straight side and go up against the, against the side, making sure you, you know, you got every area covered. And then we're going to drizzle a little bit of gastrique on it. And gastrique is just a, a reduction of, it can be um, any sort of uh, acid, liquid, like vinegar, uh, juices, oh wow. <laughs> um, you know, like citrus juices, I think they were saying you guys did uh, use pomegranate juice for it, but pomegranate gastrique. So this is apple cider vinegar, with uh, a little bit of sugar and water. So just cook down to the syrup consistency. So we're just going to drizzle that in there. Not too much, you know, just kind of cover the layer. And then we're going to go 
back, we're going to again make another couple layers of apple. Like I said, you can use different different vinegars. Uh, make the guest three. You can make it out of uh, different uh, different wines, like sherry. Um, you can do uh, make you know pour as long as it has some sort of uh, acidic quality to it. Again, yeah, a couple, couple layers, making sure that we're tight to the side. Okay, pack it down. You always want to be pressing it down so it connects. And again, a little bit more gastric. Okay, so on and so on. So you get the idea. Right? So you do that all the way to the top of the uh, terrain mold, or almost to the top. Then you'd uh, uh, take those, the plastic that's around the edges, fold it over, wrap it in foil, and cook it in a water bath in the oven. So the water would go up to about two thirds of the side of the ceramic dish at roughly 300, 350 degrees. Um, until I can't give you an exact time until it's done, you know. Depends how your oven is, what kind of oven it is. Uh, the best way to check is when you peel it back. Obviously, you want your, you know, have a nice color on it. But you know, you take your, you know, you take your sharp paring knife or whatever and poke it through. If it comes out almost like a cake, you know, where it's not, you'll, you'll be able to feel like it's cooked through. It's not like you're touching the raw, uh, raw apple. So when it comes out. It'll sort of look like this, and it definitely you know you can. It's almost like you can't pile it high enough. Like you can almost go over the top when you're cooking it, and you know you're going right up to the edge here because as it cooks, it it, it it sinks down. So you get you get down to uh, like this uh, this size or not quite that size. And why we had this uh, cardboard on here is the idea is. Uh, you want to try to make this if you're going to make this the day before, because once you get it to this point where it's baked, you know you put your piece of cardboard in here, and you're going to invert it and uh, store it overnight that way. And you want to have like um, you know, like a small ramekin or something in there because you're using its own weight to press it. That's the whole idea. The cardboard will help press it against the bottom of the terrine mold. And that will compact the layers of the apple so it gets nice and tight when it chills. So when you go ahead and slice it, it uh, you know it comes out and it comes out like in a little block and a nice little like terrine size. Any questions about that one? This one didn't. Uh, this one didn't press long enough, so I don't know if I want to convert it. It might. Uh, it might lose all over the place. Chef, can you press it while you bake it? Uh. This dish be served with. Uh, looks like it's coming out right now, so let's take a try. I'm gonna cut. I'm just gonna cut a little piece out of here. I'm not gonna invert it, so you can see the. has time to press and like the other ones that you guys are going to be getting it'll all look nice and like a brick like I said with a layered piece of apple nice and pretty you can kind of get the idea from that and we're serving this with um, 
Scheduled dates and uh, blue cheese and candy walnuts. So really great combination together. <laughs> Any other questions or? ago, one had a baby, one had gotten married, and one was on vacation for their anniversary, so I have to cover, you know, cover them at the restaurants. So it's a little bit of, you know, it's a little bit of everything. It's mostly, you know, putting out a lot of fires and just making sure everyone's doing their job. That's kind of how to describe it. Do you, do you hire and evaluate the of the chefs? Yeah. yeah. And move, move people around. Uh, we're opening it up another restaurant uh, in the spring of this next year, 20, you know, 2013. So, you know, that requires bringing more people on, moving, transferring people, you know, who fits well where, you know, who's better suited to a different number of, you know, some of our restaurants. You know, we, have, we, we have everything from, uh, you know, smaller, you know, two pizza restaurants, um, you know, Restaurants do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Greek restaurant, Italian, seafood. Uh, you know, it takes the right personnel to really, you know, not everyone is suited for the you know, for exact job. So, thank you. you Another question? It's a little bit of my area. I do a lot of the. Um, a lot of the menu development for the new restaurants, um, a lot of recipe testing and menu development for the new restaurants. But once the restaurants are going, uh, not as much. You know, that's up to the individual chefs. You know, uh, that's one of the nice things is that, which I always liked about it when I was a chef at my restaurant, um, you know, we're, we're we are a corporation now. We're big. You know, we have a ten restaurants, another one on the way. We have a retail bakery. Um, we have a full production pastry and bread kitchen. We do food for uh, two of the big theaters in the city. Um, we uh, have a catering <coughs> business, catering, off-site catering. Um, you know, we're looking into doing food at the, uh, the baseball stadium in Seattle, the airport in Seattle. Um, so. <coughs> You know, we're a big group, we're a big restaurant group, but the best thing about it is we don't treat it that way. You know, everyone sort of is able to do their own thing, uh, foster their own relationships, um, you know, uh, develop their own purveyors. You know, we, we also look, you know, look at it from a business standpoint, like obviously, you know, making sure that people are making money, and, you know, uh, you know, that point of view at times, but I don't go around saying you have to do this, you have to do that, as long as it fits within, but if, you know what, the numbers have to be right, food costs obviously, labor, things like that. So, I always found that you know, very refreshing. It makes you, it makes you really look at it as a business, as your own, you know, treating it as your own. Is that correct? We have 10 now for 12. Okay. 12 now. 
and each, each of those restaurants, you may have already covered this in 2015, but each of those restaurants has their, each individual executive chef, and yeah. two chef, and each, they have their own brigade. Yeah. 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 Each one has a chef. Two of our restaurants, we have, um, they're actually right next to each other. It's wound up being right next to each other. We took over another space next to the existing, uh, one of our existing restaurants. So in that location, we actually have one chef who oversees both restaurants, but then there's four sous chefs between two restaurants. Now, so. in an instance where, you know, when you are not working in the kitchen, say you're not covering for another chef, like you have been in the past few weeks. Yeah, it's crazy, um, crazy times. Crazy times because of, of whatever reason. How, how many times are you required to go to each restaurant in that loop, and how many times does Tom Douglas actually go in that loop? Do you go together, do you go individually, or do you mix it up and, and, and keep your people guessing? <laughs> well, Tom doesn't really do much of the operational part of it. That's what I do. And that's what my boss, Eric Naka, does. Um, we, Tom, not that he stays out of the operation, but he's the brains behind it. He works every day. I mean, it's not like he's a hands-off owner. Um, I mean, he's there six days a week doing something. Uh, you know, today is actually his, um, the release, the uh, um, public release, or the party release for his uh, fourth cookbook, which I'm missing. He's got uh, three, three other cookbooks, so he's coming out with a uh, dessert and a uh, pastry cookbook today. Uh, but he's always, there. him and Jackie, his wife, they're always doing something. We're always working. Uh, he's, he's an unbelievable business mind. Jackie, his wife, is in charge of, she's the, the farmer. She operates the farm that I was talking about. Um, so he's kind of doing his thing. You know, every once in a while, they'll be gone. You know, where's Tom? Like playing golf or something? But he's there all the time. But operationally, he kind of stays out of that part of it. That's what I, you know. So, so, so there's days where I go to every one of the restaurants. Right. Some days, I'm not only at one for some reason. So developmentally, when you're going into opening a new restaurant and a new establishment, the whole process of, of getting the menu together, do you does, is it your group? Was, was you as the, the corporate executive chef, Tom Douglas, um, and who was your boss, Eric? Eric, yeah. Eric. Would, would they be, would you guys be involved in building the menu and then finding a chef to fit that menu, or would you bring in, try to hire an executive chef already to build that menu afterwards? We usually, we usually have always hired from within, okay. so we have a good idea of who that individual is going to be. Um, we did go outside the company recently um, to hire the chef of our new Italian restaurant, Cuoco, about a year and a half ago we opened. So we did hire him from outside the company. Uh, but mostly it's people from in-house. I'm trying to think who else. So we kind of have an idea already. So you try to build a menu to fit that individual's No, not style? necessarily. It's usually Tom has an idea of what he wants to do, and he's got an idea, uh -huh. and you guess what is, is in his head. Right. So he has an idea about what he wants to do. So he's like, okay, this is my idea. So then you write down what you think his interpretation of it is. Yeah. So you write a menu, food style, this or that. Either, either says yes or no. And he comes by with a marker and he's like, yeah, I like this, you know? And you go back to the drawing board. And and how, many, how many weeks when you're doing a new menu do you test that menu? Month, two months, three months. Do you test them in, in, in a number of restaurants to see how they go, like live? Do you try to like, maybe take one dish and, and put it into one restaurant? Not usually, no. not, not, not like that. We just usually do development <laughs> testing uh -huh. and then tasting, yeah. and he'll sign off on it usually. You know, he's like I said, he's got a great business mind and, 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 and a really good idea of what people want, <coughs> surprisingly. like. Surprisingly, but it's unbelievable how he just knows. Like he knows what people are going to want, and and and, and you know uh, understand how to get people in the door. So um, I don't know. He's just really good at, at, at filling, filling so that out. So as far as ethnic, anybody can jump in with questions. Anybody, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> as far as ethnic restaurants, I mean, how many ethnic restaurants do you have? As far as Italian, you have the city of Italian. They're Italian. But the Italian restaurant is really like, it's not a traditional 
Italian restaurant. It's more of a Italian with like Northwest roots, Northwest ingredients. We have a Greek, we have a Greek like uh, North African restaurant, but again, with that, you know, it's, it's Northwest take Atlanta. that liberally. Right. You know. Now, do you go to these countries to research any of the menus? Do you just, I mean, does he? He does. Do you, uh, do you ever take you? <laughs> I, I, I went to Italy on my own. <laughs> you know, I went to Italy. I got to go to work in Italy, I think, what you knew that. But yeah. when I lived in Colorado, the show was before in Colorado, sent me to Italy to work. But I'm never at it. I'm never at it. Yeah. Um, I don't think anywhere else. I mean, he's really good about, I mean, sending people to different, you know, we go travel all the time, go out to eat, things like that. But, so as far as educating your own people, you're you're taking care of yourself with being yes. make sure that yeah. yes. being an executive chef in a corporate area like that, having ten restaurants underneath you, what's the biggest challenge? Managing people and personnel. So labor would be the most yeah. the biggest challenge? Yeah. Labor and not so much labor, but just finding good people and really managing them. There's a lot of people out there. It's just the way that you, uh, the way that you manage it. And then obviously it costs, you know. I mean, as you can all attest, I mean, it's, it's not cheap. You know, it goes up more and more every day. Everything, not just meat and fish, you know, vegetables, dairy. Are you uh, able to negotiate with your vendors saying, hey, I have 10 restaurants? Yeah. You able to get the bulk purchasing? Right. Restaurant? Yeah, we do. And a lot of the, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the purveyors, uh, already uh, have those sort of, I don't want to say contract set up, but like that sort of, the pricing is based on the type of restaurants you have. So we have 10 restaurants plus all whatever else we have. So you're already in that category where you're getting that pricing. But then that's another thing that I do is I do a lot of contract buying as well. Not as much as like, you know, at a hotel or something where you're like dialed in. Like we have, we have uh, two uh, pizza restaurants called Serious Pie, and uh, we just opened up the, the second one about a year, year and a half ago. Hugely successful, um, sort of thing where we could go any city in the country and open these restaurants. We have offers to you know, open in city, every city in the country. Paris, Korea. There's a group that wants to take it to Korea, South Korea. Um, but in that instance, like, you know, we're utilizing so many cans of, you know, San Marzano tomatoes or, you know, certain truffle cheese or whatever for the pizza. So I'll go ahead and I'll negotiate a price for that. Any words of advice or success for new students or for younger folks coming into the field? Maybe things they should focus on, maybe what skill set should they develop more? From your viewpoint. Yeah, well, that's a, good, that's a great question because I always, to be honest with you, I, uh, you know, being a chef and working in restaurants, it's tough. You know, it's hard. It's not glamorous. It's not, uh, it's not what you see on TV. You know, it's not, you know, it's not Top Chef. It's not Emeril or Mario Batali or Charlie Trotter or all those guys. You know, that's 1% of what's out there. The rest of it is working jokes, like me and Mark. You know, like, we're hard. Like my boss, Tom, like I said, he's working every day. He's six days a week, he's doing something. He's working hard for his business to get people in the door, to develop new ways to, you know, to make money and, and have people, um, you know, interact with his product and, and get his name out there. So it's a hard business, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really hard. And as you all know, you know, weekends, holidays. Um, Do you work more than eight hours a day? <laughs> <laughs> eight hours. Eight hours. part time. I've worked at places where 12 hours a day was a short day. You know? So, I mean, when I worked in Italy, you'd go in at 8 o'clock, you'd work through lunch, you'd leave at like 1 or 1.30. Go down to the beach or go and do whatever for a while. Go back at four o'clock and you work until midnight. And then you're back at eight o'clock in the morning. You do the same thing six days a week. So 
So it's, 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 it's a tough business. You know, and people always say, you know, like I, my, my own niece was thinking about going to culinary school. I was like, don't go to culinary school. Go be a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. You know, because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough business. And, you know, it's, it's, you don't make a whole lot of money right off the bat. Hope you guys are not you know, blowing your ideas or anything. But, you know, you, know, you, have, they, have, you have to have a desire. You have to have a, you have to have a desire and you have to have a passion. But if you're gonna do it, do it right. You know, put you know, put your heart into it, and, and, and have that passion for it. And when you go work, work at good restaurants, work at good places. You know, get the experience that's gonna really uh, help your career. Don't work at you know crappy places or places just to, for a job. I mean, really go out and uh, you know find yourself that little niche because there are there are wonderful opportunities. Obviously, you get these skills. You can go anywhere at work. You, know? you can go anywhere in the world and get a job for the most part. Do you hire a lot of culinary students? Yeah. Graduates? yeah. Do a lot of work with externs. Mm -hmm. uh, I get three, four extern requests every week. We actually have a Keystone grad. Yeah, in Seattle now. Then he took the tone, Yeah, he works in our uh, bakery and pastry kitchen. Yeah, great guy. Yes, they did. Yeah, it worked out really well. So. Yeah, we get a lot of, uh, there's multiple schools in the Seattle area, we get a lot of externs and they call it school graduates. Anyone else? Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. A little philosophy on the whole thing. <laughs> That's the big thing. Yeah. 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 This whole program, the visiting chef program, wouldn't be possible without the help of Michael Lusk and his staff and Sodexo Food Service for underwriting this for us. And it's a pleasure to have them in partnership with them every year. And you know, we are indebted to them just to, to bring this extra experience to our students. So thank you.